Thank you. You may be seated. Good morning, Grant Memorial. Uh, My name is Cam. I'm one of the pastors here, and we're so glad that you have joined us this morning. Uh, We're continuing uh, our study through the Old Testament book of Genesis together, and so I invite you to turn with me in your copy of the scriptures to Genesis chapter 18, starting at verse 16, so we can continue today. We're reading from Genesis 18, starting at verse 16. When the men got up to leave, they looked down towards Sodom, and Abraham walked along with them to see them on their way. Then the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all nations on earth will be blessed through him. For I have chosen him so he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just, so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. Then the Lord said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin so grievous that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. The men turned away and went towards Sodom, but Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Then Abraham approached him and said, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous people in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? The Lord said, If I find 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Then Abraham spoke up again. Now that I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord, though I am nothing but dust and ashes, what if the number of the righteous is five less than 50? Will you destroy the whole city for a lack of five people? If I find 45 there, he said, I will not destroy it. Once again, he spoke to him, what if only 40 are found there? God said, for the sake of 40, I will not do it. Then he said, may the Lord not be angry, but let me speak. What if only 30 can be found there? He answered, I will not do it if I find 30 there. Abraham said, now that I've been so bold as to speak to the Lord, what if only 20 can be found there? He said, for the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. And then Abraham said, may the Lord not be angry, but let me speak just once more. What if only 10 can be found there? He answered, for the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. When the Lord had finished speaking with Abraham, he left and Abraham returned home. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and we pray that today we would grow in our understanding of you, of ourselves, and what you are calling us to do as a result. Amen. Now it is uh, admittedly, somewhat providential that right in the middle of our church-wide fasting and prayer initiative that we would come across a passage of scripture that teaches us about prayer, about talking to God. And that's precisely what we find here in today's text, a conversation between Abraham and God. If you were uh, with us last week, you'll remember that Abraham had just been minding his own business when three strange men approached him in the heat of the afternoon. And when he saw them, the hospitable Abraham sprung to action, providing shelter, rest, and a massive feast to the travelers. Well, in short order, it became clear that these were, not, these were no ordinary men. And they hadn't simply been passing by. In fact, this was a visit from God himself and two angelic companions. And they had come to be with Abraham to pursue friendship and to reiterate the coming promise of a son within the earshot of the doubting and discouraged Sarah, Abraham's 90-year-old wife. 
Well, our text uh, picks up this morning when the meal has been eaten and it's time for Abraham's visitors to go on their way. Verse 16. The men got up to leave and they looked down toward Sodom. The translation uh, comes up a little bit short. Really, it's they set their eyes on Sodom. And so it seems that these men had more on their agenda and that their earthly visit didn't end at Abraham's house. You see, the, the same God who will display his power by blessing Abraham and Sarah with a son in one year's time was set to use his power to do something entirely different in the city of Sodom. Now, where in our study in Genesis have we heard about Sodom before? Well, Sodom, if you remember, is the place where Abraham's nephew Lot, the only one from Abraham's extended family that came with Abraham into Canaan, had chosen to settle next to when he and Abraham split ways. You remember that in Genesis 13? It said, the men parted company Abram lived in the land of Canaan, while Lot lived among the cities of the plain and pitched his tents near Sodom. And then our text added this as narration. Now the people of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly against the Lord. Enticed by the lush land of the Jordan Valley, Lot, Abraham's nephew, settled next to Sodom with his family, looking past the immorality of the people that he would be settling among. And as we read in our text this morning, not much has changed since then. This immorality has only grown with God declaring their sin to be so grievous in verse 20. Well, as God and the angels set out to go towards Sodom, ever the good host, Abraham walked along with them to see, their, see them on their way, verse 16 tells us. And it's here where we see a conversation like no other before it in the scriptures. As God reveals his plans to Abraham and even invites Abraham to provide some input, which is the first recorded instance of intercessory prayer in the Bible. Now, what is intercessory prayer, you may be asking? Well, intercessory prayer is simply praying for others or praying on behalf of others. Right? Prayer, in general, is talking to God. And there are all sorts of things we can talk to God about. In prayer, we can praise, we can give thanks, we can confess, we can petition for our own needs and desires, and we can pray on behalf of others or intercede. An intercession can be on behalf of another individual, it could be on behalf of a, a family, a community, a city, a country, the world, it can be lifting up a, a people group or a conflict, a government or a church. And what we see in this text this morning is Abraham not talking to God on his own behalf, asking God for protection for himself, for his own family, his own people, but rather he is praying or talking to God on behalf of the city of Sodom, petitioning God to show mercy to Sodom if there are any righteous people still there. Now, in just a few minutes, we're going to unpack Abraham's prayer for Sodom and see how his model of intercession provides us with the principles to ourselves pray effectively for others. But before we do that, our text first provides us with some insight into prayer in general. It, it tells us some things about God that are essential for us to know and to assume before we pray at all, let alone pray for others. And the first thing that our text tells us about God in relation to prayer is that it is God who initiates prayer. It's God who initiates prayer. Look at verse 17. Then the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Right? He asks this question. <clears throat> and then God proceeds to tell Abraham that he's concerned about the evil in Sodom and is heading in their direction. Right? God here, by sharing his intentions, invites a response from Abraham. Right? Much like we do when we converse with those around us. God 
had no requirement to tell Abraham anything, right? Think about that. God had no requirement to tell Abraham anything. Abraham would have been none the wiser if God had simply remained silent and went on his way. But God initiated a conversation with Abraham. God invited him to, as they say, enter the chat. Now, why does God do this? Well, it comes out of what we studied last week, right? God considers Abraham his friend. Now, listen to the distinction that Jesus makes between a friend and a servant in John 15. He's speaking to his disciples, and he says, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything I learned from my father I have made known to you. So according to Jesus, the difference between a servant and a friend is knowing their master's business. And here, God reveals his business to Abraham, whom he has made his friend. Right? Friends share things with one another, and God, coming out of the meal that they have shared together, further displays his desire for relationship, for friendship with Abraham by inviting him into the knowledge of his plan, even inviting him to speak into it. And church, as friends of God, we too have been invited to pray to speak into what it is that we see around us, to come to God and petition before him in prayer. But don't forget that the only reason we can pray at all is because God has initiated it, because God has graciously welcomed us to speak to him. He has gifted us a spot at the table. Church, make no mistake, prayer is God's idea. We did not come up with it. We do not demand the Lord's attention or a hearing with God on our own authority. We have been invited. We've been given the opportunity to speak to God himself because he desires it from us. He makes himself available for us to pray, something that he is not required to do. And if you really think about it, it is an unbelievable thing. Right? We don't ask our Lego what form we should shape it into when we build, right? We don't ask a canvas what colors it wants to be painted with. We don't invite our creations to influence or participate in what we are creating. Yet that, in all seriousness, is what God invites of us. God doesn't need us to pray. His ideas are not insufficient without us. His purposes are not unworthy without us. He is not at a loss for what to do without our counsel. But he has chosen to invite us to join him in what he is doing, to play a role by giving us the opportunity to speak with him about anything we want. And the craziest thing of all is that he actually mind-blowingly gives consideration and credence to our words. Pastor Alistair Begg explains it this way. He says, in some mysterious way beyond our understanding, God has pledged that it should be so that our prayers make a difference in some way that will only be explained in eternity's perspective We move something of that machinery of his providence as we come before him in prayer. He commits to his people the responsibility of moving this wheel. Which leads us to the next general point about prayer that we see in this passage. God hears prayer. So God initiates prayer and God hears prayer. This conversation that we are invited into with God is a meaningful conversation as God listens, as God hears us when we pray. 1 John 5, 14 says, And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. 1 Peter three twelve. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. Psalm 18, 6, in my distress, I called upon the Lord. To my God, I cried for help from his temple. He heard my voice and my cry to him reached his ears. Friends, God hears prayer. 
Look at what we see in our text this morning. Each time Abraham requests something of God, right? Each what if in our text. Did you notice that? What if 50? What if 45? What if 40, 30, 20, 10? Each time God responds to him. Abraham isn't just thinking out loud, talking to himself. God is listening and responding to Abraham's prayer. And beyond that, according to our text today, why is it that God was going to go to Sodom in the first place? Because he hears prayer. Look at verse 20. Then the Lord said, And the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin so grievous that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. Did you catch the important part in there? The outcry has reached me. The the wickedness of Sodom and the neighboring town of Gomorrah was so significant that That people had been crying out to God and God in turn has heard their cry. He has heard their prayers and was coming to intervene. Now more on that in a moment, but our text assures us that when we pray, when we cry out to God, he hears us and that he does something about what he hears, which is our next point. God answers prayer. Uh, Upon hearing the cries of the people, God was coming to do something, right? To answer the cries he has heard. Now, we're going to unpack the rest of this text next week and see exactly what happens, if the city is spared or not, how God answers those who are crying out from Sodom for justice, how God answers Abraham's prayers for mercy, But the scriptures are consistent in their teaching that God doesn't simply hear us, but he responds to our prayers. He answers. James 5.16 says, The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Right? That means something comes out of it. Ephesians 6, 18, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. Paul encourages people to pray, to request, because prayer does something. John 15, 7, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. And Matthew 6, 6, but when you pray, go to your room, close the door and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Right? Prayer is continually commanded in the scriptures in, in dozens more places because prayer is heard and prayer is answered by the one who has asked us to do it in the first place. And finally, in, in general terms, when we pray, our text tells us that we are to remember that God is just. Right, so God invites, initiates prayer, God hears prayer, God answers prayer, and God is just. In verse 25, as Abraham speaks to God, Abraham appeals to God's character, saying, far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike, far be it from you. Will not the judge of the earth do right? First of all, can we all agree that that is a wildly bold thing to say before God? But, but the resounding answer to this question that he poses is yes. The judge of all will do right. He will act justly because all that he does is good. This is the linchpin of this whole text and of prayer in general. Church, when we pray, we can have confidence that God will always answer in accordance with what is good and what is right. Now, it may not be how you have pictured things in your mind turning out. He may not answer exactly how you want But what he does, how he answers, will always be good and will be best. Because God cannot do wrong. He cannot do evil because he himself is good and perfect. 
In Matthew 7, Jesus teaches this through a question. He says, which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, right, offends everyone in the room, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Church, in response to our requests, God will give us what is good. He will not give us a snake if we ask for a fish. But this also means that he will not give us a snake if we ask for a snake. Right? God giving good gifts, God answering rightly, does not mean he will give us everything we ask for because he's too good for that. And sometimes we ask for that which is not in our ultimate good. Right? The encouragement here is that God will always do what is best. And while we make our requests of him, he will answer in the best way possible, whether we understand it that way or not. I think my, one of my favorite quotes is uh, this one of Timothy Keller regarding prayer. He says, regarding prayer, God will either give us what we ask or give us what we would have asked if we knew everything he knew. God is trustworthy because he is good and he is just and he does right. Now as an aside before we move on, just to add to this emphasis on God's justice in this passage and in prayer, it's God's justice that led him to this point in the first place. Right, as we already saw, verse 20, uh, God heard the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah, which means that, that God's movement towards Sodom was itself a response to injustice. Right, the, the word here used to describe this outcry to God is used in the scriptures to indicate the cries of the oppressed and the brutalized. It's the same word that describes the cry of the oppressed widow and orphan in Exodus 22. It's the same word that describes the anguish of Israelite slaves in Egypt in Exodus 3. It's the same word that, that describes the appeals of the oppressed servant in Deuteronomy 24 and the terror screams of citizens as their cities are under attack in Jeremiah 18. Now, there's been much written about the pervasive uh, sexual sin of Sodom and Gomorrah, and we will see that in full view next week. But this outcry goes much, much deeper than that. Right? These cries indicate systemic, heinous, moral, and social corruption that, that not only ignores the plight of the marginalized, but feeds off of them. Perhaps the, the greatest giveaway regarding the wicked state of Sodom is that when God goes to investigate, he goes to Sodom. Right? These cries don't come from neighboring nations that Sodom has treated poorly. These cries come from within Sodom itself, which revels in the poverty and oppression of its very own people. The injustice of Sodom and Gomorrah was brought to God's attention and a just God simply will not let injustice reign forever. Now, just as an aside, notice that God never actually says to Abraham what he's going to do to Sodom. He merely says that, you know, I'm going to go have a look. But Abraham assumes that God will destroy Sodom because he knows that God is just and justice will not allow this corruption and abuse to go on. And it's in these circumstances that Abraham makes his appeals where Abraham intercedes on behalf of the righteous in Sodom. But as I mentioned before, it is only if these four things we've just identified are true that intercessory prayer is possible, right? These four truths form the foundation of prayer. Think about it, starting with point one. If God didn't invite us to pray, didn't care about our thoughts, prayer itself wouldn't exist and intercessory prayer would not be a thing. 
or on point two, if God didn't hear our prayers, if he didn't listen, prayer would be pointless. We'd be merely talking to ourselves. Similarly, if God didn't answer prayer, point number three, there would be no point in wasting our breath. And finally, if God was unjust, unjust, point number four, if he didn't necessarily do what was good and right, we would have no confidence in drawing anything <clears throat> to his attention that would now be subject to his arbitrary and whimsical action, likely leaving us off worse off than if we hadn't prayed at all. It is only because God, who is just and good, initiates prayer hears prayer, and answers prayer, that praying at all, let alone praying for others, is even possible. Well, knowing that those things are in fact true, that God is good, that he hears, he answers, and he's opened the door for us to speak, Abraham steps through that open door and prays on behalf of Sodom. Now, I do want to make clear that Abraham is not pro-oppression, right? He's not praying for Sodom because he wants their grievous sin to continue, right? Abraham's not endorsing them or justifying their behavior. Rather, he's appealing on behalf of the righteous, namely his nephew Lot and his family, in hopes that if there are enough righteous people left, there may still be hope for Sodom. Right? This is why Abraham chooses the numbers that he does in his prayer. Right? What if there are 50 righteous people left, he asks. Well, 50 people is a community. God could use 50 righteous people to transform Sodom, to save Sodom from its wickedness. And then he drops the number first by fives and then by tens until he ends with ten righteous people, with which both he and God affirm would be reason enough to save Sodom. Well, why would Abraham end at ten? Why not five or even one, meaning his nephew Lot? Well, in Jewish tradition, the minimum number of people to establish or maintain a synagogue was 10. A believing community in Israel consisted of 10 or more people. Right? Abraham was praying not simply for individuals, but, but the sentiment is that if there was a righteous community there, even if it was this bare minimum of 10, Sodom might change. Sodom might truly be saved. There's a compassion here and a hope for something better. Abraham knew that one or three or nine individuals on their own wouldn't be able to stand against the corruption of Sodom, but in community they just might. Which, as an aside, friends, ought to remind us how important it is to connect in meaningful community. Right, church, we are not strong enough to follow Christ in isolation. We need others to walk the journey with us. And so plug in, find community, those who will stand with you as you seek to live for Christ. Okay, so let's move to Abraham's prayers for Sodom to see what we can learn about intercessory prayer, about praying for others from his example as we look to pray for others as well. And we're going to go through these a little faster than I would like. So uh, buckle up, and if you're taking notes, have your pens ready to go. So from our text this morning, we see, first, that intercessory prayer is relational. Okay, intercessory prayer is relational. It begins with a relationship with God. Th this whole thing started with God coming for supper. Remember that? It started because God pursued a friendship with Abraham. And it's within that friendship, because of that relationship, that Abraham was given the space and ability to speak to God on behalf of Sodom. If, if Abraham was not in God's presence, he would not have been able to intercede for Sodom. And, and the same is true for us when we pray for others. 
Alistair Begg unpacks this really well. He starts by pointing out that in intercessory prayer, there are three necessary participants. There's the one speaking. There's the one being spoken to. And there's the one being spoken for. And within this arrangement, there are three assumptions made for intercessory prayer to be necessary and or possible. First, the spoken for has a need. There's something to pray about. The spoken to has the power to do something about it, right? Answered prayer is possible. And third, the one speaking is connected to both, right? The one praying who is standing in the gap needs to be able to close the gap between the one with the need and the one with the power. Think think about a bridge, for example, A bridge connecting two riverbanks together. Okay, picture that in your head. Now, how helpful would this bridge be if it wasn't actually connected at one end or the other? This wouldn't be a very good bridge, right? Or, Or think about a wire going to a light switch that isn't actually connected to the power source. It can't bring power to the switch that needs it. And and it's the same with intercessory prayer. In order to act as a conduit between God and the object of prayer, we need to be connected at both ends. First, we need to have an understanding and compassion for the object. And we need to be connected to the power source through ongoing relationship with God. Right? Intercessory prayer begins with relationship with God. If we don't know God, we don't have anything to offer through prayer. Next, we see that intercessory prayer is honest. Notice that Abraham doesn't get caught up in political correctness with God. Right? He doesn't hold back what it is that he desires. Rather, he approaches God honestly. Right? Abraham tells God what he wants. Right? And he does it in a really bold way. He asks for Sodom to be saved on account of the righteous. Right? He just names it. He actually challenges God to do the right thing in verse 25. Church, that is incredibly bold. Abraham even acknowledges that himself in verse 27. He says, now that I've been so bold... But when we approach God in prayer, we can be and should be honest with God. We need to tell him how we feel, what it is that we see, what it is that we desire. God isn't a king that we must be cordial with or exercise proper etiquette with. We, We certainly come before him with reverence and respect. But if we look at the Psalms, for example, which are a collection of songs and prayers to God, we see every single emotion expressed and not everything said to God is kind or gentle but it is really honest. And that is what God wants from us. Right? What friendship isn't closer when honesty is present? Right? And friends, God is able to take our candor. He's able to take our honesty. He can handle it. In fact, he invites it of us. And so in intercessory prayer, when we're praying for others, we tell God what we want. And we ask him to bring it about. Now our next point gives us uh, the disclaimer to the previous point. Is he simultaneously uh, to being honest, intercessory prayer is humble. Right? So we're honest, but we are humble. The way that I like to put it is we can be honest in our words, but we are to be humble in our attitudes before God. Do you know the difference? We can be honest in our words, but we are to be humble in our attitudes before God. Look at verse 27. Then Abraham spoke up again. He says, now that I've been so bold as to speak to the Lord, then he gives this really interesting, self-depreciating disclaimer, though I am nothing but dust and ashes. 
Abraham approached God boldly, but he certainly still knew his place before God. In verse 30, 31, and 32, he continues to do the same thing. He recognizes that God has every right to be angry with him for making these requests. Right? As, as Abraham approaches God, he comes with a sense of fear and trembling. Abraham knew that compared to God, he and his opinion meant nothing. Right? Abraham understood that God didn't have to do anything he asked. And so when he did pray, he did so with a posture of humility. And church, we need to come before God with the same posture. Right? We must remember that we are not simply talking to a friend or a buddy. Right? Not simply. We need to remember that this friend is pre-existent, is all-powerful, is omniscient, is ever-present. He is the creator of the universe. And that, well, he graciously invites us to speak to him, and he can take our candor. We come only by his grace, and it has nothing to do with our own worthiness. Right? We must approach God with confidence, but not with entitlement, as if he ought to or must listen to us. Right? Every prayer ought to be draped in the same awe and humility that King David had when he asked in Psalm 8, what is man that you are mindful of him? What a great way for us to start every prayer. Who am I that you are even listening? But here goes. Next, through our abnormally repetitive text this morning, I, it was difficult actually reading it and kind of looking up and going, shoot, I might say the same thing again. Abraham just keeps asking, right? Did you notice that? He just keeps on asking, and his requests continue to get more courageous as he goes, right? As he converses with God and God responds to him, he experiences God's heart that, that he also doesn't want to destroy the righteous and that he's willing to save. And so Abraham just keeps on asking. And what we learn here about intercession is that prayer is not simply a one-time thing. We are to pray consistently on behalf of those who need it. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18 says, Rejoice always. Pray what? Continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 6.18 says, And pray in the Spirit, when? On all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests. Philippians 4.6, Do not be anxious about anything, but in what? Every situation, by prayer and what? Petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Luke 18.1, Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should what? Always pray and never give up. Prayer is meant to be consistent it's meant to be an ongoing conversation with God. I think so often we pray for something once, right? Maybe twice or, or for a week, right? And we think, oh, I've really given it a good shot. But then we get worn out and we give up. Which not only robs us of seeing our prayers being answered, but of spending all that time with God in honest conversation. When we pray for others, when we intercede on behalf of others, may we keep praying until we have received an answer, whatever that answer may be. And finally, we see in our text this morning that intercessory prayer is submissive. Intercessory prayer, like all prayer, ultimately trusts God. At the end of their conversation, Abraham, as verse 33 says, return home. Which means that he did not demand to go with God to make sure that God did rightly or that God kept his word. Abraham didn't demand to be the judge to decide for himself who was righteous and who was not in Sodom. Therefore, determining if God should act one way or another. No, he trusted God to be just. He trusted God to act in the way that he deemed best. Now, I know that this is a bit of a spoiler alert for next week. But things do not necessarily go as Abraham had hoped they would. 
as Sodom is eventually destroyed, although God does prove to be gracious, saving the few righteous left. But there is no record, there's no later chapter in which Abraham protests God's action. Right? There's no anger towards God. There's no second guessing. Rather, Abraham submits that if Sodom was destroyed, it must have been the right thing to do. There must, have been, there must not have been ten righteous left in Sodom, and God was the one able to determine that. And church, when we lift our prayer requests to God, we too need to submit to him and trust that he will do what is right. And this will be hard for some of us to hear, but he does not need to explain himself to us. He does not need to defend his action or inaction. Once we have prayed, we know that he has heard we can be confident in what he determines to do. The scriptures tell us that God is sovereign, which means that he is in control. He sees more than we do. He knows more than we do. He loves more than we do. He's more gracious than we are. He's simply better than we are. Which is why Jesus taught his disciples to pray. In submission to God's will. In the Lord's Prayer, before anything is requested, all is submitted. Matthew 6, 9 to 10. This then, Jesus says, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the prerequisite before the requests. Church, we need to understand that he is God and we are not. And that when we pray, while we are to be honest, repetitive and bold, we submit it all to the one who hears, to the one who answers, to the one who is good, to the one who has included us in his work for his sake and for, his, for our sake and for his own glory. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you for inviting us to talk with you. Thank you for prayer. God, that's a gift you did not need to give to us. <clears throat> and so God, help us to pray. May we not miss the opportunity to talk with you and may we not neglect to, inter to intercede. May we not neglect to look past the end of our own noses. Give us the compassion to pray for others like Abraham did. Give us the courage to pray boldly, the persistence to pray continually, and the perspective to submit humbly because you are good and you always do right. Pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.